we clearly see a trend uh, perhaps more propagated by the americans than the chinese mm-hmm. where the world is being divided into two different spheres and pretty much everybody saying which camp do you belong to i say we mm-hmm. belong to the pakistan camp Hello and welcome to G0 World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today, as the world focuses on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, yes. we take you to another nation caught in the middle of great power politics. Since 9-11, Pakistan has played a key and often fraught role in America's global war on terror. But deepening economic ties between Islamabad and Beijing over the past few years signals a shift eastward in Pakistan's foreign policy orientation. And Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan's visit to Moscow on the eve of Putin's invasion into Ukraine only serves to reinforce that. Recently at the Munich Security Conference, I sat down with Pakistan's former Foreign Minister Hina Kar, who thinks that her country should walk away from the global stage and turn its focus inward. Then we'll introduce you to some of the brave Ukrainians taking up arms to defend their nation against Russia. But first, President Putin, stop your troops from attacking the Ukraine. Give peace a chance. Too many people have already died. Moments after United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres delivered those words, Russia invaded Ukraine. His pleas for peace fell on deaf ears as Putin's troops marched on to Kiev. Calls for the international community to isolate Putin through sanctions and economic boycotts came from Washington, Brussels, and the Ukrainian capital as war broke out on the European continent for the first time in decades. But even though a clear line has been drawn between the West and Moscow, the Kremlin does still have some friends. Chinese officials have publicly called for peace in Ukraine. They abstained from a UN Security Council vote on Russia's actions, but they have also openly sympathized with Russia's position on NATO expansion. And it's clear that Putin would have consulted directly with Chinese President Xi Jinping before the attack. It's also no surprise that Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko stood close by his buddy Vladimir while coordinating joint military exercises along the Ukrainian border. And there's a new member in the Putin camp. As a major military assault on Ukraine played out, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan decided to visit Moscow to discuss cooperation on a new gas pipeline. And while Khan says he hopes the crisis can be resolved peacefully, there's no question as to how his visit will have been received in Washington. Pakistan and the United States have been allies for many years, with Islamabad playing a crucial role in both the global war on terror and the war in Afghanistan. But relations between the two countries have soured lately. Since taking office, President Joe Biden has yet to call Imran Khan on the phone. That's a move that angered officials in Islamabad. Khan's statement praising the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan as breaking the chains of slavery was also viewed as a slap in the face to the Biden administration. And during a visit to Islamabad in October, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman made it clear the United States was downgrading its ties with Pakistan. As the relationship further deteriorates, Prime Minister Khan is looking to form new alliances in order to further his country's strategic interests. But my guest today, Hina Kaur, thinks it's time for her country to step back from international politics and step up to confront the nation's mounting domestic challenges. It's not something you usually hear from a former foreign minister. Hina Kaur, wonderful to see you back at the Munich Security Conference. Wonderful to be back. A lot has transpired. Mm. since the last time we've all mm. met together. Mm. Talk to me, I mean, now that um, it's all fallen apart, mm. uh, what is, you know, what's the state of play mm. from your perspective mm-hmm. with the Taliban government today? Okay, so the state of play uh, right now, from my perspective, or should be from your perspective also, from everyone's perspective, mm. is that uh, things uh, are not falling apart, but they had, they have already fallen apart in many mm. ways, right? And now we are put, putting up, we are ensuring, I think, the international community is setting the stage for an absolute uh, failure. So you want a 100 on 100 guaranteed failure of the Afghan state uh, in how we are reacted. We've reacted to this hasty, hurried, catastrophic departure of international forces from Afghanistan. Mm. Now what happens is 
that you might be responding to the domestic demand for action and then no action. But in the process, the cost of war study tells us that we lost 926,000 people altogether in the post 9-11 wars that the US conducted. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. 363,000, somewhere close to that, were civilians. Now I ask you, because we propagate, because you know many of the problems that we're seeing and we experience every, you know, every year at Munich and conferences such as that, about you know, the grand question of international values, etc. You know, I think we have to ask ourselves the question, are we really propagating international value system across the board for all nationalities? If it was you know, the 363,000 American, British, European lives, would it still be you know, fair game? No. It won't be, no. right? And that is why interventions themselves, I feel, have broken or cast a deep shadow on, on, on the entire democratic sort of value system. So I'll give you an example. Of course, people are talking about the starving of one people who need our help. Yes. But that's like, you know, the white man's burden. Okay, not, not, not accepting what you did wrong mm -hmm. in creating the situation that is starving the Afghans right now. Yes. And not accepting that you are continuing to do something wrong to setting the stage for more Afghans to die, right? Now, for instance, if uh, an American important person were to say that uh, we, uh, you know, the Taliban must never be legitimized, I asked the question, who legitimized the Taliban in the 2020 document in which they were called the people, you know, there was this long nomenclature used to define the uh, Taliban and which country decided to engage with the Taliban direct before the intra-Afghan dialogue, which was being You're talking about the Trump administration. I'm talking about the U.S. administration. Yes, you see? that's right. So you, when you talk about Pakistan, yes. you talk about Pakistan. Yeah. You, you don't talk about Imran Khan or Nawaz Sharif. No, that's you know. fair. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so the choices you make, fortunately or unfortunately, have consequences that you don't have to live through, but I have to live through because mm -hmm. I belong to that region. Yeah, And there, the whole interventions of the last two decades, I think, have had such unintended consequences that we are going to live through the consequences of those for decades to come. The value system that you want, that you espouse domestically, you do not espouse internationally when you do these interventions. So if the Taliban are there, we need to you know, figure out how to work with them. Do you, because there is this sense mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. States mm -hmm. that there's no Taliban 2.0, mm -hmm. that in reality, this mm -hmm. is a group that is beyond the pale, that mm -hmm. you can't work with them, mm -hmm. you can't engage with them. Is your view that that's not the case and why? No, so? absolutely not. My, no. I, I am no spokesperson for them. I am not very, uh, I don't espouse to any of the values that they bring in. I don't espouse to their, you know, uh, governmental system or the values for women uh, and the fact that it's not inclusive, the fact that schools for girls are still not open, none of that. However, do I have the luxury to uh, have an ask? I mean, they are there, right? Now, mm. so, so for you to say, oh, we don't want to engage with them is basically use. Uh, if, if, if you're becoming an enabler of 35 million Afghans starving, I will judge you on that. Mm. And I have a right to judge you on that, right? Because those Afghans starving will have an impact, at least on my country and certainly on the Afghans. And forget my country's impact or your country's impact. What about the fact that these are lives and don't want to be propagators of human rights and value of human life? So where does it all go? Do we have the luxury to have grand positions that we can hold when we, especially when in the last 20 years or 30 years, we have done a pretty shoddy job? So let's talk a little bit about your country mm -hmm. and where you see yeah. Pakistan role in international affairs right now. How is it changing? Okay, so Ian, I'm a very different person than typically you would find an ex-foreign minister or a current foreign minister. I do not look for a Pakistan or a Pakistani role in international affairs. Okay, I pretty much want Pakistan to take time out and concentrate in, on its own uh, within uh, domestically. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a foreign affairs minister usually. That's not what you get. Uh, yeah. Because I think Pakistan has uh, suffered from wanting a role. So Pakistan has suffered for the last four decades for having a role, perhaps pushed on it uh, because of the Soviet invasion of one son. And from, from that then, time, then onwards, Pakistan has never really had breathing space. Uh, okay, And economically, we have weakened ourselves in that process. We have been aid dependent in that process. By the way, I believe the aid architecture. So when we, when we talk about human, humanitarian crisis and developmental, you know, developmental spending, the aid architecture, both on the humanitarian side and on the development side, is pretty much broken. As a recipient country, I managed that portfolio for Pakistan for seven years. I can tell you it is broken. Okay, whether it's USAID, uh, you know, the European Union, any, any and each one of them. Uh, so th there are many international goods that we need to fix within the international architecture. 
But from Pakistan's perspective, I, I would not want Pakistan to have any role. I would want Pakistan to concentrate inward. I would want Pakistan to secure its borders, not be, not allow threat to emanate from a very, very you know, revisionist India, if you uh, allow me to say this, from, in, uh, from a Afghanistan. Well, I'll is, push you on that later, yeah, but that's absolutely. okay. You're more yeah. than welcome to do yeah. that. I, I take the bait on that yeah, one. Okay. And uh, Afghanistan, the instability from Afghanistan, we have owned too much instability. So we've been larger than life and we said, oh, you know, all the refugees, three million come over, we'll take care of you, etc. Our first responsibility to take care of our own. Given the enormous importance of, of China's economy mm -hmm. in the region, Belt and Road, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. investments. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. say, actually, Beijing, mm -hmm. not, I mean, the Pakistan was mm -hmm. invited to uh, the Biden yeah. Democracy yeah. Summit yeah. and said no. Mm -hmm. And there was much said mm -hmm. and much written mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the fact that, well, the Chinese mm -hmm. told you not to attend. Mm -hmm. Not really. You know, I don't think the Chinese did. I, I think many, some of the wrong choices we make are on our own. You know, mm -hmm. give us that much credit. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, I, I say this because I think Pakistan has su suffered from overattention rather than lack thereof. Okay. And uh, the whole concept of a sovereign state is a state which can make its own decisions on what works for it in which situation. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we are now, we clearly see a trend, uh, perhaps more propagated by the Americans than the Chinese, mm -hmm. where the world is b being wanted to be divided into two different affairs. And pretty much everybody is saying, which camp do you belong to? I say no camp. I say we mm -hmm. belong to the Pakistani camp. And I say we are very set on remaining and we should remain within the Pakistani camp. And it is exceptionally important that Pakistan is able to build on its strengths. You know, a country which is dependent on IMF largesse cannot really uh, want to have an overprojected role in the world, right? Our first role should be to our own people. Our first responsibility should be to our own people. I think we've ignored that too much. I feel that the West is feeling so threatened right now, not because of many other things, but because it feels that now there's an alternate model, perhaps, which is giving the end uh, through means which are not democratic, perhaps, entirely democratic, as in Western democracies. And that is perhaps leading to the fear and that is leading to all of this restlessness and the helplessness. Yeah, which are the two themes that we've had two years ago and this year in the Munich Security Conference. I remember two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and you said you'll take the bait, I believe you, mm -hmm. uh, when you mentioned to me about the democratic erosion in India because mm -hmm. you referred to India under Modi mm -hmm. as a rogue state. Mm -hmm. India is now becoming the bully for the entire region and is actually going against every international commitment and, frankly speaking, regional commitments and bilateral commitments it made to Pakistan by what it did in Kashmir. Now, when you do all of that, what do you become? You become a rogue state. Which is a strong statement. Mm, mm. Do you still feel that way? He's very popular today mm, in India. Mm. He's about to win a whole bunch mm, of state elections. Mm. Do you still feel that way? You know, uh, Ian, everyone who's doing the wrong thing is popular in their own countries, mm. right? So this, you know, this whole theme of helplessness, mm -hmm. and we talked about it in the main session, yeah. that helplessness felt by people, by the, by, by the electorate, okay, creates this demand for someone coming in with an alternate system. So India, a secular, developing country with strong democratic credentials, and here comes this person who gives an alternate uh, route to India, okay, which is non-secular for sure. India, you know, since we talk, by the way, there has been the citizen amendment act okay uh, i think after that was the kashmir or just around the same time so it, it, taking it, away of the autonomy ta taking away of the right. autonomy mm -hmm. yeah. taking away of the autonomy yeah. and the citizenship act is not a small thing right because basically you're saying everybody's hindu is uh, has a right to be an indian citizen anyone who's muslim has the least right and anyone in the middle will think about it right and after that there have been attacks on universities there have been attacks on people covering their head so that is not a liberal india okay where you propagating a certain uh, person or certain set of people who are Indians and the rest are not. If you don't follow the right religion, if you don't follow the right ethnicity, if you, uh, you know, you may not be as Indian as the others, that is very, very dangerous because India is a large country. India has a regional, um, you know, presence, okay? And you, I, I will connect this to the Quad because India is in Quad. Why? Or, you know, suddenly, why has the court come up? Because all, everything that is happening in the world, or at least our part of the world, has to do with containment of China. That's and a I'm reaction going to stick to my, You know, I'm going to stick to that position. Because lit pretty much everything that is happening around our region, where the West is involved, where the US particularly is involved, 
all of it is coming in from a fear of China, from a containment of China policy. And India today can get away with murder, and the West would look away because they need they, they look at India as the only alternative uh, to containing China within the region, embroiling China in some ways. I, I think it's very, very dangerous. The, the trends in the world right now are supremely dangerous. Pakistan is a country that's mm. in desperate need mm -hmm. of investment and development. Mm -hmm. It's got to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's coming from wherever who is, whoever is willing to give it to us. That sounds right? mostly like China. That is China, and that is also other countries, whoever is willing to. So you see, the, the thing with China also is now, we have a lot of Western countries telling us, so oh, you're taking too much, uh, you know, as, not assistance, it's uh, It's investments, money. that. It's yeah. investments mm -hmm. from China. And as someone who managed Pakistan's portfolio, investment portfolio and aid portfolio for like almost seven years from 2002 till about 2010, mm -hmm. so quite a long uh, time, uh, we pretty much begged every country for the same level of investments uh, in hard loan, in soft loan. We begged the World Bank for those type of infrastructure uh, investments. It was not forthcoming. So, so then China comes up with this initiative and it's exactly what we've been asking for. Of course, we're going to take it. That's what I call sovereign decisions. And mm -hmm. so when I say we're not aligned But there to are anyone, consequences. So there might money. be consequences, but you see, the consequences are for you to figure out and for me not mm -hmm. to care about yeah. because I will do what is right for my country. I should do what is right for my country. I should make choices which are aligned with my country's interest. In the car. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Russia's invasion into Ukraine marks the beginning of a new war in Europe. And while many analysts believe that Ukraine's military is better prepared today than it was in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea, President Volodymyr Zelensky has called on his fellow countrymen to pick up arms, tweeting, we will give weapons to anyone who wants to defend the country. Be ready to support Ukraine in the squares of our cities. And they have. G-Zero's Alex Clement talked to one Ukrainian who is fighting to preserve his country's democracy. Facing a massive attack by the world's fifth largest army, Ukraine is holding out as best it can. President Volodymyr Zelensky has declared martial law, prohibited all men between the ages of 18 and 60 from leaving the country, and promised weapons to anyone who wants to join the fight. The interior minister says more than 25,000 rifles have already been handed out in Kiev alone. And across the country, armed volunteer groups have sprung up to defend local communities as well. One such group, active on the outskirts of Kiev, calls itself the Wolverines, a nod to the heroes of the 1984 film Red Dawn. Daniel Bilak, a Canadian lawyer with Ukrainian heritage who has lived in the country for more than 30 years, leads the group. This is a crime against humanity. I mean, uh, Putin and his, uh, and his gangster friends are all going to be uh, tried as war criminals. At his home, he was without power, his face lit by candlelight as the fighting moved closer to his village. Everything that I worked for to build is now being threatened, and that's worth defending. The rights and, and the great democracy, the vibrant, dynamic democracy that Ukrainians have built is worth fighting for. If you're going out on armed patrols in the middle of a war, uh, are you scared when you go out at night? I think people are just pissed off. I'm pissed off. We've had 300 years of living under uh, colonial oppression of one form or another and being basically denied an identity, a right to exist, no, our own language. Uh, by the Russians. Groups like the Wolverines may be showing Ukraine's claws against a much larger enemy, but experts like Sarah Yeager at Human Rights Watch worry about the dangers of giving out weapons to civilians with limited military training. As soon as you pick up that weapon, you are, according to international law, directly participating in hostilities, which means that you lose your civilian status, which means that you can be targeted. And it also means that you have to abide by the laws of war. And of course, nobody's had training on the laws of war. Still, with the Russian war machine bearing down on them, Ukrainians like Daniel believe they are fighting not only for their country, but for something bigger. We are fighting for every democratic country, certainly in Europe, and for democratic and European values. For G Zero World, I'm Alex Clement.
That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, and I know you do, because why else would you do this? Take a minute to sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal. <laughs>